Yeah, virtual reality is amazingly real. And here to talk to us about that uh, here on Think Tech Tech Talks is Tom Leyland. Tom and I go back to the um, 1920s. Am I right? <laughs> 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 when he was when he was a programmer here in Honolulu, and he taught me a lot of stuff, got me excited about programming, and I still am today. So I I carry the benefit of our conversations uh, from way back when. Tom, thank you for joining the show. Absolutely, thank you very much for having me. So what, so what happened? Uh, you you you've had a career of programming. You program for big and little, and this and that. Uh, give us a handle on that, will you? Yeah, I had my own company for for a long, long, long time. So I was programming really quickly, about forty years, and I had my own company for twenty something of those. And then I opted to be a, a employee at large firms. It was a little less risky. Um, but uh, generally, at one point, I said, that's fine. I'm, I'm a little tired now. And um, I still program, but I program whatever I feel like programming for me. I don't have to okay it with anyone. So it's good. Well, and what, do you do, what do you do with it? Do you sell it or keep it or give it I to play, your friends? I play. It's, um, <laughs> uh, there's a thing called a Discord bot. There's web services. There's any number of little tool things that you can build. Uh, websites even, stuff like that. Um, and then VR development is a complete in, in world kind of a thing. So you're building worlds with um, anything, vehicles in there, you can drive around all that stuff. Well, let's, let's move to that. Let's move to VR because that's what we we're going to talk about. And that's certainly, uh, to my estimation, that's your passion these days. You're invested in that. And I want to know why. I want to know how. Okay. Oh, well, I'll tell you the why. Um, uh, in my estimation, it's the early days. And if you recall the early days of computers, and I think you do, say the late 70s, early 80s, um, I would run into people left and right who said, well, what are you going to do with that? You know, you can't do anything fun. Well, uh, virtual reality is sort of in that ballpark right now. It's uh, affordable, but still a lot of people don't know what to do with it. But I keep asking everybody to think, uh, 20 or 30 years ago, did you think you would have a cell phone that's as powerful as a Cray computer sitting in your pocket? And that's the kind of thing that VR will uh, do too. It'll become lighter and lighter, less expensive. Well, more bang for the buck would be the better way to say. And then um, and more capable of doing more and more, more things. So um, you need a headset for it. Will you always need a headset for it? You'll always need some sort of a headset. And we'll see if I can show this. I don't know. Oh, look, I can. Uh, this is called a Quest 2. And there's any number of them. Uh, some big players, by the way, and I think more are coming. HP is into it. HTC, a company called Pimax, uh, Microsoft, obviously. Um, and basically, they're running two types. There's a uh, consumer type, which is what Quest is doing. And, and then there's professional ones. And the, uh, the Quest goes for about $300. The professional ones can be $12,000. They can be $5,000. But incredible resolution, but not the average person is going to be using those. So, uh, so I put one of these headsets on. Yeah. And it, it and I can't see anything outside the headset. I'm I'm invested you know my my vision is the headset. And uh, okay then then I can walk around um if I move it knows I'm moving if I turn my head it knows I'm turning my head. I'm I'm living in the world of virtual reality. Um, and I can probably walk right into a wall and hurt myself that way. Uh, I can, yeah, definitely swing your arm into a wall. That's going to happen. <laughs> so. but, um, and so it's, it's really three-dimensional and it's, it's uh, interactive. Yeah, we, we use the term immersive. I mean, it's, it's actually almost hyper uh, three-dimensional. I mean, you're literally in this immersed world. Um, and just to clarify one thing, there is a thing called AR and VR. And virtual reality is completely virtual. Um, uh, AR is more of a, uh, adding stuff to it. So you would be looking through your glass and seeing the real world. And then it's accessorizing that with additional information. 
and they have two different uses. Corporations, you can imagine uh, of really quickly, somebody working on, say, a car engine, being able to see the actual car engine, but then looking up in the corner of his eye and seeing a diagram of the stuff he's supposed to be seeing. So there's, there's that. And there's something now they call mixed reality in, as well. But virtual reality, yes, is a complete manufactured world. Well, on, on that, uh, that thing about AR for a moment, I remember um, this is this is probably 20 years ago, but I remember a fellow had uh, a little thing it was like it, it hung down on the top of your glasses and you could see the diagram of the car and, and yeah. whatever. It was essentially a browser. It was a monitor in a browser and you could see things and it would help you do whatever you wanted to do. And it, actually, the computer was attached to your belt uh, and so forth. So if you have an AR rather than a VR situation, that's on the you know hardware side, that's pretty easy to achieve. Um, and you can have that in, in a business setting, in a design setting, in, uh, gee, I can think of a million settings where you would want to have your, your friend on your glasses giving you advice, uh, you know, being essentially, essentially a, a, a 24 by 7 Google thing where you can look up <laughs> You know any question, and and that will assist you as your best friend in life. Is that coming? I I believe it is, and I think I mean I don't use it much, so I really don't know. But I believe it's under development right now. Certainly, large corporations have those kinds of things available to them. But it's a kind of a rarefied air. Most of us don't work on uh, aircraft engines and uh, stuff like that. So we're not going to need that kind of stuff as much as we are there to have fun. And the fun is that total immersion thing where you are literally on a spaceship uh, or um, and you're flying it. I mean, that's how real it is. You're literally flying upside down. Microsoft, just as an example, has a flight simulator now that flies in real time. So you're not only flying a 747, but the time it takes for you to fly from New York to Paris is how long it would take in that 747. So it's just, I mean, just amazing in, in terms of simulation. So you got involved in this because you were amazed by the reality of virtual reality. And that means as a programmer, uh, you would want to mm, create it because you can't help yourself. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so you started creating it. How do you create virtual reality? The, the easiest way to begin is to find uh, an application that assists. And those are typically called social apps. And there's any number of them. Uh, one of the biggest known ones is VR chat, though I caution people to not jump into VR chat and think that oh, everybody is this crazy. They're not always that crazy. <laughs> um, there's other ones called Big Screen, Mozilla Hubs, uh, VTime, Alt Space. I'm just dropping names here. One of the biggest players is, um, in terms of pushing the envelope is Neos. I recommend anybody look for these people. But those apps allow you to drag and drop things. You can spawn a sofa, resize it, drop it there, uh, put a light, turn, make a light switch, hook the light to the light switch. Um, so that's how you just do that. But that means you're using other people's things to build your world. The next step up is Unity, and that's an application uh, editor, and that allows you to build anything your mind can dream up. Oh, my God. So yeah. do you have to have the, the headset on when you do this, or could you use a, you know, just an ordinary computer program um, and, and do it that way? I think um, you tend to uh, do the final touches on the worlds that you design. We call them worlds. Uh, you do that with the headset on, or you very often put the headset on because you want to see that it still works correctly, similar to the way you debug software. But you would do the majority of the design work on the PC, and you can rotate models and things like that while you're designing them. But um, it's just because you'll, it's just easier to do it on a computer. Uh, I think. So let's talk about the potential on this. Uh, well, before we do that, let's talk about what you're doing now in terms of designing the, the world, the virtual world. I, I would make a guess and say that you, you, Tom, have built a virtual world. You've taken assets, you've created assets, you've made, I mean, this is really enticing. You've made a world that you can live in. You can get up in the morning and enter this world. Uh, what is it like and what do you do in this world? 
Yeah, I'm I'm going to qualify everything I say with I'm no expert, but um, I do have fun and I try and push the envelope where I can. And there are certainly people it's a it's a slightly different than being a programmer. It's more of a modeler. And so I think it's a little bit more of an artistic sense and not quite so much of a mathematic scientific endeavor. Um, so I can create uh, programmable things, but the artistic side, that's still, I kind of go grab somebody else's model and work from there. And that's the other nice thing about it. You can actually grab models. They are, many of them are free, or you can buy these assets, as you mentioned, um, for in a, relatively inexpensive. Go get a $20 castle or a car, a Chevrolet, you want a 57 Chevy, and there it is. <laughs> Change the color, change the lights, and uh, drop it into your uh, world. Um, so yeah, and basically they create people create environments for meeting other people, and that's one again one of the big pluses is that you invite people to your worlds and you can chat. Um, some of the worlds, again, I mentioned Neos, you can literally interact so I can pick something up and hand it to somebody, and they can save it and they can bring it back the following day. All of the assets are interchangeable and, you know, are sort of live. It's uh, so, so, okay, that's another dimension. So you can put your headset on, connect it up to the internet. I can put my headset on yeah. uh, and we can engage wherever we are in the world. We can have a conversation. We can do things together. We can mm, we can trade assets. We can operate assets. I can take you for a ride in my in my in my Chevy. Um, I Absolutely. can take you for a walk in my castle. I had a friend uh, drive me, fly me in his helicopter. And, um, <laughs> <so>. <laughs> yes, it's uh, it's all doable. And again, this is tip of the iceberg. So remember, we're, do, we're talking about 2022. Um, again, a couple of years where it's been, um, the price has been that everybody can get in it. Another five years, we're gonna be hard pressed to recognize it. And in 10, we didn't even dream that it was possible what we're going to see. But um, I did wanna mention a couple of things so that people don't think it's all, um, uh just at uh, social apps um one of the things is though uh, is education there's a lot of use in education um there's a lot of case of self-learning and stuff because you can immerse yourself you can imagine that if you wanted to learn a foreign language you could drop in and either work with um avatars things that are just not really people uh, but you're conversing with that person and it's a little different than talking into say your phone or an app which is nobody there uh lots of science and that's uh, space medicine there there is actually an app it's a full body you'll see a, a body show up you can rotate it uh you can strip off the skin see the nerves see the bones um zoom up zoom in all that kind of things um uh, fitness strangely enough is one of the things people get on and they're jogging or rowing in in a virtual world so there's uh, a lot of things like that and then uh, just straight on entertainment you can watch movies in there uh so again you have kind of three-dimensional movies going on and stuff like that so a lot of uh, a lot of possibilities. Oh, and let me answer. I have a note. I just wanted to mention one thing. If you think there's some, what's coming down in the future, they've already have haptic feedback. And so what that is basically is you have a vest on or something. So uh, somebody taps you on your shoulder and you feel the tap. And somebody, maybe if it's a shooting a game, somebody shoots you and you feel a thud as it hits your chest. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> the possibilities are limitless. <laughs> yeah. Well, right. let's let me let me let me track on some of those things. So, um, you talk about um, a, another person who joins you. Now, this person who joins you, say in the in the in the, in the car or walking through the castle, what have you. Um, th this is does this person have the face of the individual you're connected with in Bolivia, or is it an avatar? And what's the difference? And what's preferable? Ah, very. That's a really really good question. Um, it's all 
avatars, and it depends on the game, everything called the games or the app, um, how, what level of avatar you have. Some have full body avatars, so your arms, legs, head, everything's there and moves. Uh, again, Neos can do that. Some are just upper body, and that's, for instance, um, alt space. You don't have any legs in alt space. They don't figure you need legs, but you have hands. Um, <laughs> um, they're almost always customizable. And I would say generally uh, there's two giant, three maybe categories. There are humanoid-like looking ones. So, so they kind of look like you. Um, I might add some photos of one of me, uh, but you can make as many avatars as you want. And then they have the other ones. There's a whole group of furries and there's a group of say robots and stuff like that. And so they are whatever their imagination imagines them to be. <laughs> it's, even size, you don't have to be human human size. I know one guy in Neos, he's a car. And literally, his, it's a car avatar. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm familiar with a program. It's, I guess it, you call it an animation program where you put your photo. It's called Reillusion. And um, you put your photograph in and you, you have to actually connect, or a photograph of anybody, you know, have to connect um, dots, uh, lines, um, to the photograph, um, and then it will it will animate your face. In other words, all I'm giving it is my photograph. That's all. But now it will animate my face. It will it will talk. It will you know it will have uh, expressions and so forth. And I'm thinking, well, it's not that far from an avatar, you know, which is a you know a sort of an advanced cartoon, I suppose, on to a, to one of these real illusion faces where you've made it into a real face. So I can I can have you as an avatar, but I can advance you with that kind of software to look just like you, Tom, and act just like you. Uh, yes, and uh, I'll give you again. You I'll give you an example of a friend of mine on Neos who has. Um, he's an amazing avatar designer, and he has some what are called trackers. And the trackers are watching not only his body and his legs and his hips, but his face, his tongue, his eyes. Um, he was mentioning he was going to get two more trackers for his shoulders, so that when he hunches his shoulders up, his avatar does that. If he flexes his arm, you see the muscle on his avatar flex. <laughs> Um, and that's all wired in. He's, he's gone through and said, when I do this, do this. Um, and it is quite extraordinary. But I think the tool that you're talking about, I'd love to look the, into that uh, possibly as a, a way to help. Uh, maybe as a design, start with that as a design. They're using a lot of standards, which is one of the things that's important for any of these tools. Uh, it has to be an avatar standard so that you can import it into any one of these worlds. So... Yeah. Well, so so actually, there's so many wonderful, delicious questions here. Honestly, uh, <clears throat> so I told you before the show about a movie I remember being made involving a, a heroine whose name was Aki Ross. She was like an all-purpose person, and yeah. uh, it was a it was a space movie. It had a very thin and you know um, un, un, unassuming plot. It was, but it was that. mostly about her and um and she had a personality and she could speak and and the movie made her a movie star um they didn't do it again and i'm sorry to say i haven't seen anything like that since then but you know this discussion of uh, virtual reality makes me think that that could happen that we could take uh, this uh, kind of uh, facial recognition we could take you uh, and make you into a movie star uh which is very realistic which uh, you know emulates your actual personality, and then I use AI to have you conduct yourself in a certain way under certain circumstances. Smile, frown, say this, say that. I can even program what you say. I can make you into, you know, how in two thousand and one. Uh, yeah. And better, uh, I can make a personality out of you. I can put you on the screen and you won't have to join the union. <laughs> there we go. Um, it, it will perhaps eventually happen. And, and the movie you're talking about is Final Fantasy. And I, I love that movie. I thought it was, at the time, it was 
A1, the hair would move. You would just see every detail and you knew it was yeah. fake. But yeah. Boy, it looked real. <laughs> yeah, and that was that has to be 10 or 20 years ago. Yeah. Uh, and now you could probably do much better with that and you could create this character. She was yeah. very pretty and a, a lovable kind of, uh, uh, you know, image. Um, mm -hmm. But I think they could do better now. And I think um, it's so easy to to move. You know what's in a movie? A movie is the plot. A movie is the the props, the background. A movie is the way they relate to each other. And and uh, I I believe that once you invent uh, Tom Leland as a as a movie star, and uh, you know put put him together with uh, uh, Angela jo Jolie as a Jolie as a you know co-star, um, I could think of a pretty good plot. Um, we all can. We can think of a pretty good plot and we can put our our characters, our virtual reality characters together and have them react to each other. It would be just as persuasive as any first run movie, wouldn't it? I think you need to write that down and copyright the idea right away, because seriously, what you could do is simply let each individual make their own little version of the movie. So here's the plot. Who would you like your co-star to be? Uh, they'll pop up the lines for you to read. And, uh, you know, all the background comes in and everything. But it's you as the star. I think that yeah. would be crazy. Yeah. And, you can, <laughs> and you can play with it and play with it and play yeah. with it until, until you know it's going to be popular. Yeah. Um, the, and the question is, what depths? you know, of programming ability do you need to give to the movie designer? I mean, I think at first you'd need a real pro, but then after a while, you know, you could make it such that anyone can do this. And, and then, of course, you have real competition for Hollywood. You have a whole new spectrum of, of, um, of intellectual property uh, that, that has market value. I, I see this coming out of what you're talking about. I think uh, there's a potential. Yeah. Most definitely. So the other thing that, uh, and this is sort of right in the middle of what we're talking about, is you talked about this as an educational tool. I mean, the, the body, for example, where you can look inside the body. I mean, that's got to be great for medical schools, which spend a lot of money on, on dummies, you know, to teach mm -hmm. medical students. But it, it goes beyond that. You could program the avatars. You could program the experience. So the individual with the with the with the, the headset is is in a learning situation where somebody says to him, "Nice move, Tom, but that didn't work. You made a mistake there. Let me explain how you should do that properly." And and then you learn with the best possible teacher you could have, who is way smarter, who has got all the knowledge, and who is able to watch you one-on-one. -on -one. What a great learning experience. Uh, absolutely. Plus, this is, again, this idea of having, um, and a lot of the worlds can't do it, but, but I, for, the, for the third or fourth time, I'll mention NEOs. They should be happy that I've done this. Um, but there's an example of where you'd be able to pick up a scalpel or pick up this and actually do the operation and then hand the thing to somebody else or the other person's holding the dummy's head, uh, because it really does have that kind of uh, detail in the modeling. And so, again, if you if you say it's not all just fun and games, but it has a great potential for learning and for education, uh, would, somebody just has to apply it. That's all it is a matter of. Well, you know, we live in a time of COVID where people are forced to stay at home and do their thing. <laughs> they have meetings this way. They, 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 they learn, they watch, they, you know, and, and I think it's, it's built into our culture to some extent after now the th third year of COVID. Um, and so I'm thinking, well, do I really need a classroom of people physically together? I mean, you know, the big problem with uh, higher education is nobody wants right now including UH, no, nobody wants to, um, you know, bring the class together because of the risks of, of COVID. But if I have the class together in virtual reality, it's almost as if you are together. You can interact. 
Yeah. Well, let me give you a plus on that as well. You're not you're not stuck with just people in Honolulu or just people in Connecticut or just people anywhere <clears> else. You're getting a select group of people from around the world. So you're interacting with a guy who really in London who really wants to do this and a guy in Paris who really wants to do this. And so you're getting sort of the best uh, cooperative group. You know, it's a, a group you co you're compatible with and pull them together. And so, yeah, I think I actually I was going to mention that I, I socialize with more foreigners now, I speak in foreign languages and stuff with people um, on a regular basis than I do my neighbors. And I jump into VR and I'm talking to somebody in Holland or somebody in uh, Kuwait or somebody in Scotland. Um, and I do that on a daily basis, you know? Oh, so that's now indeed. I'm talking, yeah, talking to somebody in Russia and saying, well, what's the story in Russia right now or the Ukraine? I'm talking to somebody there. <laughs> so... So, but you don't speak Russian. It speaks Russian for you. Oh, no, I speak. They speak English traditionally, although really quickly, I think we're running a little short on time. Really quickly, they do have a um, uh, automated um, translations in alt space. Right now it's beta. But the point is, I speak in English and the listener can say I speak Spanish. So do the translation. I speak English and a, a sound bubble comes up and has it translated in real time. It's just. It's getting better and better. You know, Tom, we, we are into <laughs> international stuff. Yeah. I mean, we're uh, on um, April 1st, we're doing a, a program involving seven continents all at the same time on wow. Zoom. And what you're describing is really very interesting for that kind of collaboration. And it's not only our programming and our treatment of global issues, it's the collaboration in science, the collaboration, which means so much. So you could have a collaboration to beat all collaborations with scientists in every continent collaborating on their latest work. Absolutely. Um, and no flights and no uh, hotels and uh, no time lag or any of those kinds of things. It's immediate. Yeah, no parking. No parking. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Oh, what, well, how far advanced is this? In other words, you talk about, um, you know, your um, your engagements with uh, other VR people. Um, uh, what's what what? How many people are doing this? Um, do you have to search them out? Is there a place on, on the web that I can find somebody who has a headset and has the software and the interest? Yes, I, I would suggest, yes, there, we do have a couple of places where people gather, but it tends to be application uh, specific. There's actually a, an app called Wander, which if you know Google, Google Maps, and you know that there's this street view in Google Maps, right? Well, this is Google, Wander is Google Maps in VR. You're walking down the street with five other people, up to six people. So I can show you my neighborhood and there's my house and then go down the street and here's where I work. And um, so, yes, anybody who is into Wander would sort of meet up. Uh, and then I say, if you if you belong to Alt Space, there are places there where you would chat and say, I'm going to go into Alt Space today. I'll see you there. Everybody has a not only a different avatar, but they have different names. They make up complete names for themselves. <laughs> but so uh, if you take you know your imagination on that, which is extended and my perception of it which is extended by this discussion um where does this all go how is this going to change the world i mean i can see it's going to change education it's going to change uh, probably going to change the media because i can talk to anybody anywhere um but you know how else is it going to change the world will it here's my question is it going to make the world a better place or will it be used for nefarious purposes Yes and yes, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but what, what will, yes, what will happen, I think, well, what's happening now, by the way, I was just speaking with somebody on Alt Space today, and I was uh, suggesting that who you're meeting right now are the early adopters, again, similar to computers. So you see a person in, in a headset from Saudi Arabia, and I've, I've talked to people from Iraq uh, and uh, Oman and stuff like that. Well, these are, and, and these are not the average person there. These are people who went out and spent a fair amount of money to get into virtual reality. And so you're going to meet these kinds of uh, future thinkers. And they say, well, you know, I want to be prepared for five years from now. I want to know what has, what I'm 
doing. I don't want to be, uh, it dropped in my lap in five years. So um, we can't predict the future. That's the trick. But I'm going to suggest similar to computers, it will be used for good more than it will be used for evil. But there will always be some evil in there. By the way, real quickie, don't anybody get caught up in all of this um, Cryptocurrency is not related to VR um, and all these other kinds of things. People are trying to throw these in and they can be a part of it, but they aren't universally a part of it at all. Let's assume I, I hear this discussion and see this discussion and I really want to know more. I want to be prepared as, as your friend in Oman, was it? I want to, <laughs> I want to be prepared. <clears throat> so uh, where do I start? Uh, what are, what are the steps I take to fully appreciate the um, you know the leverage of it and to actually engage with others uh, here and there? Uh, a, a couple of quick notes. Uh, one is do a little tiny bit of research. Um, so I would suggest doing a uh, internet search uh, for virtual reality and stuff like that. Look at some of the videos that are available. They'll show you um, immersed videos of people who are walking around in these different locations. If you have a little bit of spare money, invest in a headset. Don't go for the cheapest thing in town and because it would be the same as sort of getting the cheapest guitar and then saying, well, this sounds horrible. I know you got the cheapest one, that's why. <laughs> uh, you don't need the $5,000 one, but again, the Quest is a, a quite a bargain at $300. And it'll allow you to experience uh, a, almost everything that's out there. And if you think it's well, well worth it, you can go buy a $1,500 one. But if you don't think it's worth it, you only spent $300 to find out. <laughs> so um, I would say jump in and um, experiment a little bit. And uh, I, I don't need a new computer. If this will connect up by USB. Uh, strangely enough, the uh, the Quest 2 is completely wireless. So it doesn't require a computer at all. It has the computing built into the headset. And uh, yeah, so you're still you're still good if you have a PC. I mean, I use both, but you don't need to at all. You need to have broadband though uh, available to in order the to get faster on the, the better. The faster yeah. the better. Yeah. And and finally, uh, where where do I go to two things? Where do I go to learn about this? I guess Neos has to be one of them. Uh, and where do I go to to find out who's online uh, so that I can actually connect? Well, now you bring up an actual, we need a whole nother 30 minutes, and that's the whole idea of the metaverse. There's no, there's no single place at the moment. They're all a bunch of individual unconnected places. But that is the goal, ultimately, that there is this sort of metaverse that allows you to jump from app to app or world to world with a minimum amount of effort. Um, right now, I speak to somebody and say, oh, let's go over to a Wander. I'll be on VTime. Both of us turn VTime off go on to wander and meet there. But it'd be nice to just transition over there. But um, I, again, I'm going to suggest that the people do a little bit of research, um, read up, watch videos. There's all sorts of tutorials, by the way. That's the other thing that's good on YouTube. It's filled with people explaining things. And uh, anywhere from a five-minute introduction to uh, several hours, there are courses, complete courses you can take for nothing, for free. Mm -hmm. So even if you don't use it, here's again, I'm a sort of an educator at heart. Even if you never write a line of code, you can take a four hour course on Unity just to see how it works. You don't have to key it in just because they told you to do this now. <laughs> you know, just watch it. <laughs> hey, Tom, I, I, you know, I do accept that uh, you are an educator at heart. And I remember how much you taught me back uh, 30, 40 years ago, whatever it was. <laughs> and uh, you're, you have changed a bit. And uh, <laughs> I, I hope we can get together again uh, to talk about this uh, or other related things. And maybe you could tell me how to make ThinkTech into a virtual, virtual reality global experience for everybody. We'll do that. We'll see if we can't put together one episode in a virtual world. I've got guys who can do filming inside of there. And yeah. they can broadcast, stream it straight out of there. Tom Leyland, mm -hmm. a, um, a programmer and a virtual reality uh, aficionado. Can I say that? Uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Extraordinaire. Thank you so much, Tom. Thank you very much. It was really nice to with you again. The same. Aloha. Mm -hmm.